Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. We're going to cover understanding DOCSIS 3.1 upstream transmit power. I'm Brady Volk, founder of Nimble This and the Volk Firm. Our show on all things DOCSIS, welcome back. With us is John Downey, CMTS technical leader at Cisco System. John, welcome back. Oh, thank you very much. Good to be back. When's the last time we did this? Uh, you... This is our first show since uh, December. So how uh, how things been since then? Uh, same old, same old. You know, it's DAA 204, DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, things are moving ahead, I think, with a lot of people just trying to get that one gigabit per second upstream. Yeah, there's so there's a lot of activity in the upstream, right? A lot of customers or a lot of cable operators are starting to deploy OFDMA. Great news. With it comes some new challenges. Uh, so we're going to be covering that today. A lot of interesting things. We kind of did a little pre-show talk about uh, even some of own confusions you and I have with OFDMA in the upstream. So hopefully we'll demystify some of those today for everyone. First off, though, we're going to start with some in-the-news items. Um, so first off, in the news, uh, Tom Clunan, Doxus Pioneer, is uh, he's retiring. So, Tom, we are going to miss you. Thank you so much for all your great contributions in the industry. He's leaving as big changes at Comscope continue to change. So most recently, he served as interim CTO at Comscope. Following his departure uh, some of uh, Morgan Kirk, um, Tom has uh, you know, he's had a great role in the industry. Um, with he joined Comscope in 2019 after they purchased Aris for 7.4 billion dollars, uh, where he was also a CTO there. And, uh, you know, thanks for light reading for uh, keeping us up to date on all this information. Uh, next up in the news, uh, Cable Next Gen event, which is, uh, they hold this every year. Actually, I have two events every year. It's going to be virtual again this year. Hopefully, the last time will be virtual. This year's event, they're going to cover a bunch of timely topics, such as Doxis Ford Auto, 10G, DAA, Fiber to the Premises, 5G, Mobile Spectrum, Wi-Fi 6, Smart homes, power grids, edge computing, and more, just to name a few. I will be speaking there um, on some virtualization. So please join us on Tuesday, March 15th, and Wednesday, March 16th. If you're looking to register, just Google Cable Next Gen Event, and you're going to see their registration page to sign up. So it's a great opportunity to get a lot of technical information from the uh, comfort of your home, or your laptop, wherever you want to do that. Uh, next up, add, yeah, go ahead, John. I would add, I would add one more thing. Uh, call for papers for SCT Expo. Oh, yes, those are out. Uh, also, yeah. call for papers for Expo. So if you're interested in participating and presenting at next year's Cable Tech Expo, make sure to submit your abstracts. Philly in October, maybe? I yes, it remember. is in Philly. Okay. So. Um, and the spring edition of Broadband Library is now live at uh, HTTPS broadbandlibrary.com. So please do visit the site. Lots of good technical information out there. Check out Doxis online. I have an article there. It's starting to cover some of the content we're going to be covering today about Doxis 3.1 measuring upstream transmit power. Uh, so a couple of things to, to get in on there. Um, anything else, John, that's, uh, you're thinking about in the news you want to cover? Yeah, I mean, um, uh... <laughs> cover them all yeah we'll go cover it as we go or yeah. it'll pop into my mind and i'll just blurt it out you so john me. you and i uh you know we talked many times about ofdma channels they're referenced to a 1.6 megahertz uh reference i think we've glossed over that many many times we were then do a deep dive and what exactly that means and and how that applies to you know how we how we measure channel power in the upstream does that the, you know, how that applies to other signals like SC QAM channels. And I, in this episode, we're really going to do a deep dive into that and understand how to measure total channel power, how SC QAM or OFDMA channels are measured, how SC QAM channels are measured. And we kind of start off with a slide or an image that I had in, in the last, uh, or in this current issue of Broadband Li Library Magazine, where I show an image, we're going to put that up in the screen, with a 1.6 megahertz reference, an OFDMA channel that starts at 5 megahertz, goes to 20 megahertz, which means that OFDMA channel is 15 megahertz wide, 
uh, and it has guard bands. Um, we have two SE QAM channels that are centered at uh, 24.4 megahertz and 27.6 megahertz. Each of those are 3.2 megahertz wide. And then we have two more SC QAMs after that, each 6.4 megahertz wide, one at 32.4 and one at 38.8 megahertz. So we have one OFDMA channel and four SC QAM channels. But uh, two of those SC QAMs are 3.2 megahertz and two is 6.4 megahertz. And I've, I've done this intentionally because this is, you know, this is kind of the scenario that we see in a lot of plants where you have a mixture of SC QAMs and OFDMA and we all are kind of left scratching our heads, you know, how do we how do we measure these channels when we go back to the DOCSIS 3.1 standard that says all of these channels should be measured with respect to a 1.6 megahertz reference. So I just want to toss that back to you, John, because you know we always say it's 1.6 megahertz reference, and and I know when we were t chatting before this show started that. There was a lot of confusion in the early days of DOCSIS on whether, you know, how CMTSs measure these powers um, just for SE qualms alone. I, I'd like you, I'd like to throw that to you about some of the confusion we've had before. It used to be the, the big three CMTS vendors were Cisco, um, Aris, and Motorola. And then Aris bought Motorola, Comsco bought Aris, Aris bought Secor, and the Cisco <laughs> SA was together, right? So it's, like it that, it's like that. It's like that. That old AT and T commercial, how they bought everyone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you break it and then you break it back up again. Right. Um, the I know how Cisco works, and that's we made a conscious decision long ago that if you went from 1.6 to a 3.2 to a 6.4 megahertz wide upstream channel on the fly, it would drop by 3 dB on the spectrum analyzer. We keep same average power. So if we say uh, the CMTS wants to see zero. Well, if I start out with a 1.6 megahertz wide channel and it pumps out 45 dBmB, it's going to hit the CMTS at zero. But if I go on the fly, turn it to 3.2, that total power is still going to be zero, but that you're like taking this narrow carrier and spreading it out and squishing it down by 3 dB. Same total power, but it drops 3 dB on the spectrum analyzer because you doubled the channel width. 10 times the log of two is 3 dB. So if I go to 3.2 to 6.4, it drops another 3 dB. And that's how Cisco decided to do same channel power regardless of upstream channel. That way, if you change the channel width on the fly, the modal transmit levels wouldn't change. Because right. if you do it the other way around, you say, oh, when I change the upstream channel, I double it. Oh, I need to transmit 3 dB hotter to get the same power spectral density or power per hertz. If you do that, now you run the the problem or the probability of modems hitting max transfer power right from the but, very beginning we're like you know what we'll do same average power but customers then look at a spectrum analyzer like the trace you just showed where the 6.4s are 3 dB lower than a 3.2s and a 1.6 would be 3 dB higher than those right but did did was this followed consistently across the industry no. or did some, no. you know, did some vendors deviate, which then end up causing confusion? That was part of, I think, the gray area of it and why 3.1 came out and said, hey, we're going to reference to a 1.6. Right. Because back then there was no real, no one really said, what are we supposed to reference to? So some customers or vendors would do power spectral density. So on a spectrum analyzer, all the channel widths were the same reference level. Correct. But uh, Cisco wasn't, that's not the case. And I, and I think that is one of the benefits that came out of the, the DOCSIS 3.1 specification was they said, we're just going to standard everything and we're going to reference to a, a 1.6 megahertz reference. And I mean, 1.6 megahertz was a, was a valid and, and often used upstream SC qualm DOCSIS channel that, that we would use, particularly if there's a lot of noise or yeah. you know, a lot of times we didn't need as much upstream traffic in the early days of DOCSIS, DOCSIS the, 1, for example. Remember the early three before that we dropped? It was a 0. 0.2, yes. a 0. 0.4, and a 0. 0.8. <laughs> yeah, That's we don't use narrow. we don't use really narrow bandwidths <laughs> in the upstream anymore because we the need lots of data. The 0.2 would be like, well, it would be like what an ISDN or something, you know, yeah. 200 kilohertz wide. <laughs> yeah, I mean that. I mean, granted, we could use those for for like DOCSIS set top boxes, DSG, DOCSIS yeah. set top gateways, um, but you know, yeah, they were all dropped from the spec. Yeah, with, yeah they're not, with, not used anymore. SDDMA and all those smaller channel lists were all dropped. Yes. 
So, so one of the things that I covered in the broadband library paper that, um, you know, if you have not read that, uh, the, the article that I wrote there is, is actually the math that is very simple formulas. It is how you do that conversion from 1.6 megahertz to 3.2 or, you know, basically what, what is the math that John kind of went over real quickly to do the conversion from 3.2 megahertz to 6.4 and how you get that power difference, which is, you know, simply 10 log of 3.2 divided by 6.4, which gives you 3. 3.01 dB. Yeah, 3.0, um, yeah. So that's your 3.01 delta, 3 dB, basically a 3, BD, 3 dB delta that you see between the 3.2 megahertz SC qualm and the 6.4 uh, megahertz SC qualm channels that you see on on the slide. If you're listening to audio, you have to take my word for it that there is a 3 dB delta. Anytime you're on a DOCSIS 3.1 CMTS, you're always going to see that 3 dB delta because we're always referencing everything back to a 1.6 megahertz bandwidth. Everything will always be referenced back to that. Uh, so we can see the deltas. But again, the math for that is in the uh, uh, broadband library article that I did um, in for for spring 2022. Just in case you're listening to this in a, in a different year. I mean, the, the knee jerk response and the easy reference is anytime you double double bandwidth, it's three dB. Anytime you half d, half bandwidth, it's minus three dB. Yes. So that, if you look at a 1.6, yeah. If you look at a 1.6 compared to 6.4, you just double twice, right? It's a 4x. So that's going to be 6 dB. Correct. So it's 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 pretty quick math to be able to do, you know, look at something like that. Now, I think where the math gets a little bit more complicated and, and not so obvious is with the OFDM channel, because the OFDM channel can can be anywhere from, I think the smallest is 6.4 in the return. Keep me honest on that, John. And mm -hmm. we can go all the way up to a 96 megahertz OFDMA channel in the return. So now um, that's where it gets a little confusing. And, and I, even I struggled for a while and I had to reach out and phone a friend to say, you know, how do we calculate this OFDMA channel? When and when it's always referenced to a 1.6 megahertz reference, so that one that one tends to trip people up. The challenge becomes um, we we basically have to take it regardless of what the bandwidth is. We take it and we slice it into 1.6 megahertz slices, and then we multiply those slices by the channel power of the OFDMA channel. So it's really taking 10 log of the OFDMA channel divide the channel width by 1.6 and then multiply it by 10 to the to the power of whatever that channel uh, power is and divide that by 10. We'll see those formulas shortly because it's kind of, I kind <laughs> of, you know, boom, boom, everyone's head just went boom. What are you talking about? Hey, Ron, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, so we have those formulas coming up and I'll make a little a little bit more sense to everyone as we're calculating with the, with the, total the advent of zero. mobile phones and apps you think it would be a simple app i know, you know cable apps or sct and, make yeah. an app for calculating this it made it a lot simpler for me because i didn't do it yeah. all in excel mm -hmm. so um you know another thing that uh to keep into consideration here is when when we're looking at all these channels we we have to calculate the total power of all the channels at the same time because that's how the CMTS looks at it, and and we'll start to get into that as as we start to see how uh, how all these channels are calculated when we start to add padding moving forward. So that that's something that I, I think differs. And and John, maybe you can kind of keep me honest in that. I, I think with earlier versions of Docs's specification, the CMTS would kind of look at channels in, individually, um, but now we look at total channel power. But I'm kind of interested in your take on that. So like when we would do DOCSIS 2.0 or DOCSIS 3.0, when we would do, say, four-channel bonding, um, did the CMTS look at the total power of all channels or would it look at the channels individually? Yeah, it's, it's you know, when a mo modems are dumb, right? They lock onto a downstream, then they get the upstream channel descriptors, and then they start randomly picking upstream channel and try to range on it. So that ranging happens. Hopefully there's no contention or collisions. And uh, once that first upstream is ranged, then the CMTS and cable modem sort of know time offsets. It knows uh, the frequency it used to range, obviously, and the level. Now, when it goes to range on the other upstreams in the bonding group, there's different settings in the CMTS to say, do I want to do a station maintenance range or initial maintenance range on the other upstreams? So you have some choices there to make it uh, less contention and collisions. 
Um, but back to your question of how did they determine what to use? The CMTS, in regards to Cisco, we manually create upstream bonding groups. And when it ranges on the first upstream, and then the, the CMTS says, well, I have a four-channel bonding group here, and you're a four-channel capable modem, but you ranged on one upstream, and this is the level you needed for one upstream. And the CMTS is going to say, all right, well, here's four channels. And if you do all four, the power level you just gave me for one channel is not going to work. So it can determine and say, yeah, that power level you ranged on for one channel is not going to be legitimate if you want to do four-channel bonding. Then the CMTS will like, forget it. You can't do that four-channel bonding group. You'd be maxed out in power just by that one channel you ranged on. And they can say, well, is there any two-channel bonding groups available that I manually created? And if not, I'm going to relegate you to a single channel. Now, that single channel is still called single channel bonding, which is really strange because it sounds like an oxymoron, right? Single channel bonding, you're not bonding anything. But because it's in MTC mode, it can do something called CCF, continuous concatenation fragmentation. So that modem might show UB as upstream bonding, but in reality, it's doing single channel. It'll get better than DOCSIS 2.0 mode, but it still won't be doing upstream bonding in regards to all four channels. Right. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of decisions that are being made during initial ranging and uh, the initial registration. Right. So, so again, it's it, the CMTS is still not looking at the total power of all all the upstreams pre DOCSIS 3.1. It's still kind of looking at individual channels. If, if I can summarize you correctly. Sort of. I mean, I can give you an easy example. It would be, let's say the modem ranges and it, it says uh, on upstream channel at 36 megahertz, it needs uh, 53 dBmV. But we know a DOCSIS 3.0 modem without extended power can only pump out 51 on each channel uh, if it's doing four-channel bonding. Well, if it needed 53 on one channel, they're already maxed out. And the CMTS might say, well, you're so close, I'll let you do it. And then in other cases, it might say, no, you're already 53 for one channel, and the max is 51 for four channels. But I do know if I go to two-channel bonding, the max is 54. And if you did 53 on one channel, and the max is 54, you're under the max, so I'll let you do two-channel bonding. Perfect. Makes perfect sense, John. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to go to the next slide, because I think this will add a, a little bit more um, uh, color for everyone on kind of what we've done with DOCSIS 2.0, DOCSIS 3.0, and up to DOCSIS 3.1 on what the, the max transmit capabilities are for cable modem. So we see in DOCSIS 2.0, it was really simple, made sense for everyone. We had a max transmit of just one channel for any given cable modem in the upstream of 54 dBmV. These were, the, these were simple days, simple times made sense for everyone. DOCSIS 3.0 added a little bit more complexity. If we had just one channel, we could transmit up to 57 dBmV. And then as John is talking, as we added more channels, like four upstream channels, the max transmit power was 51 dBmV for each channel. Uh, we have some modems, you know, some systems now we are expanding. We're doing eight channels with DOCSIS 3.0. We could go up to 48 dBmV. And then we had something called a, an ECN uh, in Multi 3, version 3.0 that allowed cable modems to transmit higher than 51 dBmV. So that engineering change notice, you know, we, we wanted to get more transmit power over our modems. John and I have covered this many, many, many times. But we can now have modems transmitting as high as 61 dBmV in DOCSIS 3.0, just for the SE let's, qualms. Let's, let's quantify that, too, because you didn't put it in the column there. That 61 was total power for a single channel. So like you pointed out, 51 dBmV for four channel bonding. That meant four channels were all 51. Correct. It, if if I do 51, 51, 51, 51, that's four channels, 10 times a log of four, 6 dB. So that's 57 dBmV total power. Correct. So basically that 61 ECN you just put is about 4 dB higher. Yes. But it, yeah, but it, someone it looked helps at a your lot. Numbers, that's, yeah, someone that's looked at your dB numbers, is a lot more. 61, they're like, holy shit, that's 10 dB more. It's like, yeah. no, that 61 was for a single channel. Uh, for the ECN. So yeah. what we've seen with the ECN, the extended power ECN, was maybe 3 dB more. But 3 dB is double power. Double the power. So, 
it's twice yeah. as much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's we're not gonna just uh, we're not gonna like it's not, not trivial, want it, right? By any yeah. means, is it not trivial? Um. So then, Docs is three dot one, which we're gonna talk about for the the rest of the presentation, is uh, gives us a total, and and this is total power again because across the board is sixty five dBmV. Um, so and and then we'll see how we get to that total power. So it doesn't matter whether it's you know, one channel or many channels. It's always going to be 65 dBmV transmit power referenced to a 1.6 megahertz uh, channel. You know, with uh, the throw even more confusion in there in Doxus 2O and 3O, that max transmit power was dictated by the modulation you were using. Yes. You remember that? Yes, remember yes, which adds more, more confusion into it all. If it was QPSK, it could go up 6 dB from what the number you have listed there. Like yeah, the yeah so I remember dB. that uh, when I was working for a test equipment company, that would remain nameless, um, that was a challenge we had in our meters, uh, depending on what modulation the meter was in, QPSK or 16 qualm, it could transmit higher. Uh, I think it was QPSK a transmit higher than in 16 yeah. Quam. So even us yeah. as a meter company, we were, you know, kind of battling that whole uncertainty of the specification as well. So I know the, the vendors were too. Um, so, you know, we have to uh, ask everyone if you're enjoying the content, please do subscribe, hit the notification bell. Um, so you can just uh, get notifications when we're broadcasting. Appreciate the support. Back, uh, Back in the presentation here, so so one thing we do is, you know, we do try to estimate what the, the transmit power is from the modem. Um, that was actually a question that came in from one of our viewers, and I put this slide together in the article I wrote in Broadband Library as well, and I said, yeah, it's kind of hard to do that if you, if you unless you know exactly what the the loss is from the cable modem to the, to the CMTS, and, um, and it's extraordinarily hard to actually measure that loss between the modem and the CMTS in the live cable plant. And I, and I said, you know, really the only way you can do that accurately is if you're able to take the cable plant out of service and, and measure that loss with, with some type of device. So what I did is I said, you know, we can do that in a, in a lab plant. Um, so I did that for my lab plant. I, I, I use a, a network or a vector network analyzer. I swept the plant, and, and this is the response that I got for the purposes of just kind of estimating, you know, what kind of transmit power we should have from the cable modem to the CMTS. Uh, at the red marker, which is at 5 megahertz, we can see in, in my lab network, we have a, a loss of about 35 dB. And at 42 megahertz, where the green marker is, we have a loss of about 38 dB yeah, not dBmV, about 38 dB. So 35 at 5 megahertz and 38 dB of attenuation at 42 megahertz. So it's about 3 dB of tilt from 5 megahertz to 42 megahertz, which you know, it's not too uncommon actually in a, in a typical plant environment. So taking those values, we can kind of estimate what our, our return is knowing what we've configured our CMTS. And that's another big unknown for many techs out in the field because the person who configures your CMTS can, can configure their CMTS in a number of ways. And, and in this scenario, I've configured two different settings in the CMTS, and, I, and I've done that intentionally. So, for example, I configured the receive level at the CMTS for OFDMA channels to be 0 dBmV. That means the CMTS wants to have any OFDMA channels to arrive at the CMTS for a zero dBm for a zero dBm is zero dBmV input with respect to a 1.6 megahertz channel. On the other hand, I configured the CMTS for SC qualm channels to have a plus six dBmV input with respect to a 1.6 megahertz channel. So that means that the SC qualms are going to come in 6 dB higher in receive power at the CMTS than the OFDMA channels. So that, that's going to change some things in our calculation. So we can estimate that OFDMA channel um, for a 0 dBmV input is going to have to transmit at roughly 35.4 dBmV, uh, or I'm sorry, for a 0 dBmV input, the OFDMA channel um, with a 35.4 dB of loss 
is going to have to transmit roughly a 35 dBmV to hit the CMTS at 0 dBmV. And what we can see down here is the OFDMA channel is transmitting at roughly 36 dBmV in order to hit the CMTS at 0 dBmV. So we our calculations were off by uh, roughly 6 tenths of a dBmV. So not bad on our calculation there for OFDMA. Any comments on that, John, for what I did? Yeah, for yeah. My... The, the big thing is, the question will be, why did you do that? Someone might look at that and say, is, am I supposed to do that? In reality, most people would think about doing what you did, but flip it around. They would add 6 dB to the OFDMA, hoping to get better MER, hoping to run higher modulation schemes, and then let the single carrier qualm do, do the normal default. Because single carrier qualm can't go higher than 64 qualm anyway, and it's usually pretty robust. If you're doing OFDMA, it's to get more speed. And, and your spectrum allocation, I would have flipped it anyway. <laughs> I would have put the OFDMA at the high end and shifted my single carrier qualm down lower uh, because I want to get more speed out of my OFDMA. Yes. Yeah, so, well, you know why I'm putting the OFDMA at the low frequency is because I'm testing it with noise. And uh, yes. that's one of the things that we saw a lot of cable operators do when they first started deploying OFDMA was put it in a low frequency as we've talked in many episodes before, because they thought, well, OFDMA will perform really well in the noisy spectrum, when in actuality, it, it arguably doesn't perform as well. To, to your point, put OFDMA in a higher frequency. Don't do what I'm doing in my slides, but I'm doing this for um, specific reasons that I'm trying to see, like, well, how, how can we get OFDMA to work better in the noisy spectrum? Um, so, so back to the sides. Similarly, uh, with the SC qualms, um, we have 38.6 dB of attenuation in our return path. We have to reach the CMTS with plus 6 dB MV of receive power. So we estimate the SC qualms to be transmitting at 44.6 dB MV. And what we see on the CMTS is they're transmitting anywhere from 44.25 to 44.5. So our, our estimated transmit power of 44.6 is you know, pretty accurate. We're, we're only off by about a tenth of a dBm, a tenth of a dB. But as John says, you know, would you actually do this? Probably not, because again, you're not really going to know what the attenuation is between the C the cable modem and the CMTS. The, the cable modems are just dumb devices, and rarely are you ever going to know what the losses are, the inherent losses are within a subscriber's home. Um, and you're there are a lot of other unknowns in the cable plant that are, are also going to be variable, like micro-reflections, group delay, things that we've talked about um, from a proactive network maintenance standpoint that come into the play here. Now what I want to talk about is, um, so we talked about, you know, this cable modem has a maximum transmit power. It's a DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem. Its maximum transmit power is 65 dBmV per the DOCSIS 3.1 specification. But how do we calculate, how do we know if this cable modem is at its maximum transmit power of 65 dBmV? So at the very bottom of this slide, uh, for those of you listening to audio, I'll talk your way through it. For those of you watching video, it's going to be much easier. Total transmit power um, gets a little bit a little bit tricky, and, and, uh, and even I really struggled understanding the DOCSIS specification on how to calculate this. So let's, let's walk through it. So first of all, it's going to be 10 log. Most you know, anytime we calculate power, it's going to be 10 log. And we're going to calculate that power for each upstream channel. So the first part of this equation is calculating the power of the OFDMA channel. And remember, I said that OFDMA channel, we have to slice it up into 1.6 megahertz channels. The OFDMA channel itself is 15 megahertz wide. So we take that 15 megahertz, that the first part of this equation is 15. I take 15 and divide it by 1.6. So we're taking that OFDMA channel of 15 megahertz wide, dividing it into 1.6 megahertz chunks. Why 1.6? Because I said that this OFDMA channel is always going to be referenced to 1.6 megahertz wide bandwidth. So we have to slice it into 1.6 megahertz chunks. So after we, we slice it into the 1.6 megahertz chunks, then we multiply it by 10 to the power of whatever its power is. In this case, that OFDMA channel has a 36 
dBmV transmit power. So we see it goes 10 to the power of 36 divided by, and I see there's an error in my equation here. Uh, I'm just going to fix it on the fly. That should be 10 to the power, whoops, of 36 divided by 10. Now my equation's right. Uh, so that, that allows us to calculate the OFDMA power. 15 divided I, by 1.6. I wanted 1. to be 6. specific also if the 15 should be 14. Like, yeah, uh, you know, that's so and to, and John, what you're what game. you're getting at, I think, is really important. I'll, and I'll let you describe why. Yeah, the the OFDMA is 15 megahertz on your spectrum analyzer, but there's half a megahertz guard band on both sides. And according to the spec, the power level doesn't include exclusion bands and guard band for OFDMA. So you take 15 minus one would really be 14 megahertz of usable bandwidth. On the single carrier qualm, we don't do that. We don't look at the filter alpha. You know how like 6.4 channel really is only 5.36 or something like that. No, actually 5.12 because of the filter alpha. But for single carrier qualms, we just do the whole channel. Correct. So your, your math should have been, I think, 14 divided by the, the 1.6 to see how many slivers of 1.6 fall into the 14 megahertz of usable bandwidth of OFDMA. And then you're multiplying by the power level of each one of them to get total power of the OFDMA. And then you wanted to add in the power of all the single carrier qualms. And all you're doing is you're taking a power level that's in dBmV, converting it back to a millivolt, sort of, to millivolt in power terms. Because technically, if you, did, if you wanted to convert to millivolts, you divide by 20, right? Because millivolt is 20 times a log. But because it's power, there is a relationship there. So we divide by 10. Uh, so we take all those back to millivolts, add them all up, and do 10 times a log of the total. Correct. So we're trying to take all these dBmV readings, put them into a unit measurement, add them together, then take 10 times a log, get total power. Exactly. There's Excel spreadsheets that do that. And Yes, you, you yes. Yeah, and I mean, I would recommend everyone build their own Excel spreadsheet. The, the formula is right here. It's quite easy to put together now. Um, so then, then after we've calculated our power for the OFDMA channel, um, calculating the SC QAM channel power is very simple. It's just 10 to the power of what the transmit power of the SC QAM is. In this case, it's 44.25 for the first SC QAM divided by 10 plus 10 to the power of the second SC qualm, which is 44.5 divided by 10, and so on. So we just add each SC qualm up and we get a total power of 51.72 dBmV. For all of the channels, this cable modem is transmitting in the upstream. So it's, a, it's kind of a long formula. That's why this is something you definitely want to do in Excel or, or have a, a, a nice calculator that will uh, update this for you. Um, now, what I, what I want to show is I'm going to add some attenuation to this modem, and I'll keep adding attenuation to this modem until we see the modem reach its max transmit power. So let's, let's add some attenuation into this modem. I'm going to add 16 dB of attenuation in the upstream and also the downstream to this modem. We'll see how we start to get closer to the max transmit power in the upstream for this modem of 65 dBmV. So we added a 16 dB pad in, and now we can see that this modem, um, all of its upstreams have started to increase in the transmit power. So the OFDM A uh, is now transmitting at 46.25, and each of the SC qualms are transmitting at 53.75, the next one 54.25, 56.25, and 56.75 for the uh, fourth SC qualm channel. We use the same equation. It's just updated for, um, and I, again, I have the same errors in this uh, equation, uh, but the channel power is now upgraded to the total channel power that this modem is transmitting is 62.66 dBmV. Still not 65 dBmV, but we're getting close to that limit. And the modem's quite happy. So, John, any comments on this before I move to the next slide? Uh, I guess um, it, it's it can be confusing just looking at the CMTS readings on levels. You purposely set plus six on the CMTS for the receive level. Um, then the question is, is that CMTS vendor reporting the 1.6 equivalent or the channel width? I know from my perspective, Cisco, we, we wrote a bug on this 
where with DOCSIS 3.1, we know modems are reporting based on 1.6, which is fine, but our zero DBMV on the CMTS was still a channel width reporting. So we wrote a DDTS or a bug to say, hey, uh, when I do a show cable modem verbose or show cable modem normalized command, that zero DBMV for 6.4 really means minus six for 1.6. If that makes sense. You yep. understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. You want to be able to say, here's the modem transmit, here's the CMTS receive. They both need to be based on the same reference. So I know the difference in between. Correct. Because I take one, subtract the other. That's the attenuation from point A to point B. Yep. Okay. So um, we're going to go one more step. Now we're going to take the, uh, we're going to put a 20 pad. So we had four more dB of attenuation, and this gets the modem up to just shy of its max transmit power. All upstreams are still online. We see that our OFDMA channel is transmitting at 50.5 dBMV. Our, and our SC qualms are transmitting at 54.5. 54.5, 57.5, and 57.5. And our so when we take those values and we add our add them all up in the equation we've been using, we see that our total transmit power is at 64.38 dBmV. So we're just about a half dB of our max transmit power, but all upstreams for this modem are online. We're just coming in a little shy of our receive power that we'd like to have at the CMTS, but otherwise this modem's running happily. I was running about, I think about 500 megabits per second in the downstream and about 300 megabits per second in the upstream using iPerf over this modem while I was performing this test to make sure the modem was happy and not having any issues with this amount of padding and the levels that were on here. Um, so happy modem at, uh, at its maximum transmit levels. And no issues. So thoughts on this, John? We're getting what yeah, we I mean, paid for out of the like modem. I mentioned about the, the receive level, like uh, go back to that graph or that, that table. I assume this um, software you're running to, that looks at the receive level, not too far. Um, is it, re it's already in a 1.6 equivalent. Like, you know, you're showing the, the power levels of go back to the slide with the power levels or with this your one. 23 dB pad or your 20 dB pad. Oh, you're talking else. about the actual power levels, which, which yeah. pad did you want to see? The, the 16 pad? or the 20? 20. Yeah. So, you notice the OFDMA says 46 and it even says 1.6 equivalent right there in your, in your table. But are the other channels based on channel or 1.6? Uh, they're all based on 1.6. All right, good. So, and that's one of the things you have to ask yourself or validate or verify that this CMTS vendor is reporting in a 1.6. Yes. Yeah, all of them are. Because I, I mean, I've concluded that based on my measurements that all, all of them are based on a 1.6 uh, reference. Okay. So... All right. Um, so I, I think we covered this aspect. We have a couple questions in the chat room that I just want to go over. Um, one of them is, uh, so first of all, John, they're, they're complaining about your, your headset. Uh, so we got to get some better audio on your end uh, on, the, on a headset. We'll work on that. Um, Kim Angel asks, what is TX beamforming? So TX transmit beamforming is something that you're going to see on a, a wireless system, not on a cabled system. And what that's going to do is um, uh, multiple antennas, um, and I think they normally call them like MIMO or something like that. They're, they're going to identify where your access point, you know, where you're at. And they're, they're going to make sure that that wireless signal is going to be more accurately transmitted directly to your where at. To where you are, um, there are people that are well far more educated on me and on to exactly how beamforming works. But it's not related to to Doxis. Uh, it's going to be more related to probably your access point or maybe your cell phone. And then, is it necessary to have PMF enabled on your router? I know I've come across PMF before, but uh, I can't remember on the top. And I, I can't give you advice on on whether or not you should or should not access PMF. I'd, I'd recommend to, to uh, search that up on your on your router. Um, if there anyway anyone else has relevant questions on on you know what we've talked about today, go ahead and post those up. I think we'll have, cover a few more topics before we wrap this up, and then we can get back to to Q and A. John, I want to talk um, just wrap up with you on. 
Um, a couple of more topics with respect to DOCSIS 3.1 and the 1.6 megahertz bandwidth, um, specifically on what you've seen from a standpoint of like things, because I know we talked about a little bit with should we have, like I've set OFDMA up to zero dBMV and my SC qualms up to plus six dBMV. You know, so from your perspective, is is that a good practice, not a good practice? Should we keep OFDMA and SC qualms all at the same level? Um, what do you have from a standpoint of best practices in your experience? So because 3.0 modems inherently have more power than a 3.0 modem, like we talked about 65 dBMV, if you do the math, a 3.1 modem has 5 dB more power than a 3.0 modem that can do H-channel bonding. Mm -hmm. So it is relegated with more power because we're going to go to 204 eventually. So let's say you have a 3.1 modem in a 42 megahertz plant. You have a lot more power for the 3.1 modem than the 3.0 modem. So you probably have enough reserve that you could jack up your OFDMA if you are doing OFDMA, like 5, 6 dB higher than your single qualm, get better MER, still not run into max transmit issues because you have a higher power modem. And then uh, you'll have higher modulation schemes you can run with OFDMA. I suspect you could also move that into an 85 megahertz system and still have plenty of power and maybe run the OFDMA 2, 3 dB higher. But once you get to 204, now you get even more spectrum, which is why we needed more power. So you'd probably have to drop it down anyway. So um, I think you could manipulate your levels a little bit, but keep in mind the CMTS has an upstream port that has a gain stage, it has calibration to it, and it's trying to look at all these disparate channel widths and modulation all on one port. Remember, you're coming in with all these channels on one port, one physical port. Our recommendation is don't go more than 6 dB delta between the different channels. Meaning if I'm going to do OFDMA, don't set it to plus 10 and the single carrier qualm is zero. Yes. Because the internal calibration and gain stage is not going to know how to calibrate properly. Yeah. So so I'm so one of the things that I've been struggling with and and is Every tech out there knows, you know, we we all we run in frequently to modems that reach max transmit power. Whether that's because we have an amplifier going bad, or it's because we have a subscriber that's taken their modem and moved it to the far end of their house. And when I think of OFDMA, it's it's a new technology that we're deploying, a new upstream channel, right? And OFDMA channel can be wider, so it can consume more power. It's going to eat into more of that 65 dBm. MV total transmit power that we have. And one of the thoughts I had about that in, in, in your, is if we take the OFDMA channel and set it at a higher transmit power or a higher receive power at the CMTS, as you're suggesting, doesn't that eat away from the total transmit power that our cable modems have? And wouldn't the OFDMA channel then ca potentially cause our modems to, um, to go off, you know, to run out of transmit power early? So, and, and that's why I mentioned the 3 1 modem has more power up front anyway. 3 1 modem has more power than a 3 0 modem. Mm -hmm. So, you might find that, you know, here's your cable plant. The modems are close to maxed out at 50 dBMV. I put a 3 1 modem in, they max out much higher than 51 dBMV. Right. So, I have more reserve. So, I could, you know, increase my OFDMA. But like I said, as soon as I start increasing the spectrum, then that, that's all bets are off. Because we're, we're because still using more power, power, right? When we increase yeah. the spectrum, even though the 3.1 modem has more total power, because the 3.1 modem is going to use more of the spectrum, it's going to be using more total power. So now we're, it's almost like equivalent of a DOCSIS 3.0 modem because the 3.0 modem is not using as much spectrum. I, I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, you had enough spectrum for OFDMA that was 20 megahertz wide, and you said, let's do a plus six, and it works. As soon as you go to 40 megahertz wide, you have to drop down to three, same power. So when you go to 80 megahertz wide, you drop down another 3 dB, and you're at the same power you started with. Right. Right? Because you double the spectrum, you need to drop by 3 dB every time you double. Okay. But how... I mean, so... Uh, I guess I'm just spectrum, trying to struggle because I... Reserve. I'm, I'm struggling because I'm trying to figure, figure out, you know, how do I... 
how do I maintain, how do I keep my modem online and, and preserve my SCQAM legacy subscribers? Because I'm, I'm not going to have maybe as many Doxus 3.1 OFDMA subscribers initially. So I, I want to keep that modem online. And when my modem reach maximum transmit power, I want my OFDMA channel to fall offline first and still keep my SCQAM carriers online for as long as possible. Here's the interesting point there too. Spectrum allocation. You already showed where you had more attenuation at the high frequency, 38, mm -hmm. versus your lowest frequency was only 35. That's 3 dB difference, right? You're going to have so, tilt. You're going to have more yes. attenuation at higher frequencies than at lower frequencies. So the higher frequency channels will hit max transmit sooner than lower frequency channels. Right. So if I put my OFDMA up at the very high spectrum, Technically, it might hit a max transmit before your single carrier qualms. So the OFDMA channel will drop offline first. The modem will go into partial mode, and we'll still have our SC qualms. Yes, because once a modem is already, once a, it, there's two steps here. What happens when a modem tries to register and register properly, and then what happens in the ongoing station maintenance? You know, they keep alive every 15 seconds or whatever it is. Um, if it's already online, fully bonded, and then temperature goes up, attenuation goes up, and then modem transmit levels change, then that will dictate when the modem goes to partial mode. So it's not going to uh, drop a channel and then recalculate max transmit. The modem just goes to partial mode, and it still has the same max transmit at once, even though it might only transmit on one or two channels. Right. It doesn't recalculate max transmit unless it re-registers. So... So, and, and I think we've said this before, that the DOCSIS 3.1 modem is always going to be better performing than any modem before, DOCSIS 3.0, DOCSIS 2.0, and you just kind of nailed it exactly. So if it drops that OFDMA channel, it's still going to have 65 dBMV total transmit power to put into maybe the just two SC QAM channels, and it's going to stay online with more attenuation uh, between it and the CMTS when a DOCSIS 3.0 modem or a DOCSIS 2.0 modem is going to drop offline because it just doesn't have enough total transmit power. It should. It should. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I think what, what we it, have to do is prove it. You worded it kind of weird, but uh, okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> I worded it kind of weird. <laughs> All right. Well, I think, I think we got the point across. I mean, the 3.1 modem is going to stay on. It has more total transmit power than any other modem. Doxus 3.0, Doxus 2.0 before it. Correct. I, I think that's the that's the goal. That we, I mean, that's the information we want to communicate. I think we've communicated how to calculate total transmit power for a Doxus 3.1 modem. Doing the same for a, a modem before that with a CMTS before that's not so straightforward because there's going to be mismatches depending on who the vendor is. Um, so that makes things more complicated. But when we get the 3.1, it's clear, it's cut and dry. We know the formulas. We know how to do it now. Yeah, I think one clear. of our, our last uh, sessions we do, I talked about DRW too, right? Like the yep. dynamic range window and how disparate single carrier qualm channels can really screw that up. And it all came down to the modem transmit level and what it's based on. If the modem transmit level was not based on 1.6 uh, and then we do comparisons, then that dynamic range window of 12 dB becomes a little gray, pokey. <laughs> like you could have uh, a 3.2 megahertz channel saying, hey, I need to transmit 42, but the 3.2 mega or 6.4 says I need 52. Well, that's 10 dB difference. Yep. And it's 3 dB difference just because of the channel width. <laughs> because 3.2 and 6. So that difference in channel width can really screw things up in the modem transmit level differences as well. Kind of like what is being reported? What is it being referenced to? And how does the dynamic range window determine what's legitimate and what isn't? You know, it's, it says 12 dB, but the 12 dB just looks at the modem transmit levels. And, and that could be really screwed up because of different channel widths and how I'm, how I'm reporting it. Well, hopefully this all gets resolved when everyone must migrate to DOCSIS 3.1, and it even makes the DRW a little simpler. Okay. So. All right, John, um, upcoming events, anything on your window? No, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm hoping SCT does a, a, a mixed um, virtual and live expo. Uh, I hope to uh, attend also the, 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 the 
What's the one coming up you just mentioned? Anger, oh, the uh, next gen yeah. event? Yes. Yep, the next gen event. That looks like it could have some really good information in it, right? Absolutely. I mean, those are always good. I, I like, I, I don't, I don't uh, heckle, but I like to get on the chat windows and we can like talk back and forth on the chat windows. And yeah. even some of the presentations are pre recorded. Sometimes you'll end up chatting with the author or the speaker. Yeah, because wow, they're all, they're all there on the speaking. event. It's it's very good. You know he's not speaking, but he's chatting with you at the same time. I'm like, oh, that's good. Yeah, it's kind of nice to be able to like work some things out and people can see it. Hey, so we had just one last question come in from uh, Tomas Wozniak. Uh, what happens when upstream SEQAM and OFDMA channels uh, high stack will be on the same level? So I'm not. Uh, you understand high stack will be on the same level. Sorry, Tom. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not understanding it either. Yeah, yeah. Well, this uh, smooth nights has a question. I think is that uh, I understand that maybe Tom can clarify his question while we address smooth nights. Can we drop the SC qualm on a plant and only rely on OFDMA? <laughs> you lose all your legacy modems, yeah. right? I mean, you need to. If, if you have nothing but Docs three three one, you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. If we get rid of all the three O and two O modems, but it might not be just that. Maybe you have some set top box doing DSG, box to set top gateway. You might have some EMTAs with Docs two O modems with voice. So now you need some carrier qualm. And you're probably going to have some uh, power supplies out there that for a long time they're still going to have uh, status Docs monitoring. Yeah. Yeah, status monitoring equipment, power supplies. So I think it's going to be a long time before we have nothing but OFDMA in the upstream. Yeah. SC Qualm well, is going to be around we, for a while. We can, we can eventually kind of squeeze out more uh, spectrum for OFDMA and start eating away at the, the single carrier Qualm, right? And we start dropping that down to one or two. Yes. Um, so, hey, David Brown, good to see you. And uh, Raymond says, does he mean high split? I think he's referring to Tom's, Thomas's question. Oh, oh, for uh, so what happens when the SC Qualm and OFDMA channel high split will be on the same level? I wonder if he's that's referring to there. Will be on the same level. Does he mean yeah, power I'm, to us? I'm, I'm still, sure. It's still not, still not <laughs> clear for me. Tom, get us yeah. next time. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll get I, your My your recommendation question. is, and we talked about this before, is spectrum allocation. I think single carrier Qualm should stop at 40, 40. Probably 40 megahertz. Oh, you Anytime know. You go above 42, Doxus 2 and modems are going to lock on a frequency that doesn't work very well. Yes. Yeah, so modems are going to lock, lock on and they're going to get partial mode when you want to relegate them down below. I think OFDMA from 42 up is the best bet. Well, I, I saw a really good case and you you you, you hit it right there, John, with a Doxus 2 o modem in an 85 megahertz plant. So the Doxus 2 o modem has a diplex filter in it, right? The DOCSIS 2.0 modem doesn't always, will try, some DOCSIS 2.0 modems will try to lock to a frequency that's above its 42 megahertz filter. What that causes is phenomenal amounts of group delay. So remember, DOCSIS 2.0 modem only has one upstream channel. In an 85 megahertz plant, if you have a channel that is just slightly above or just straddling that DOCSIS 2.0 modem's diplex filter, the, the cable modem will try to lock to it, and it creates a really, really poor performing upstream on that DOCSIS 2.0 modem that's locking, say, to a frequency that's you know right around 42 megahertz center frequency, yeah. if you have it configured that way. So it creates ugliness for that DOCSIS 2.0 modem. Even though it may have lower frequency channels that can lock to it, sees one, it's like, hey, I, I might be able to lock to it, and it does. And you've got a really poor performing, uh, you've got a really unhappy subscriber on your hand for that. Uh, so yeah, so Raymond, he says, heck, we just got rid of corner. Oh, wow, Cornerstone. That is an old CMTS, Raymond. <laughs> I'm glad you upgraded. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah, happy yeah, that to get rid of that some, one. That probably has some voice at 1.5 megahertz wide, it way is. down on the low end, right? Like the yep. T1 or whatever it was. So that, and, yeah, there's a lot of old CMTSs out there. They're still in service. And I think it really shows... You know, Doxis 1.0, 1.1, even 2.0 stuff still out there, still running, still serving customers. So, all right, John, let's bring this in for landing. Um, thank you for your time today. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks for uh, those contributing in the chat room. Uh, we will be back probably in another month with great information. So thanks, everyone. See you soon. All right. Take, take care.